Okay, so today's video is going to focus on taxonomy and a little bit of an introduction to the first couple of kingdoms. So taxonomy in general is just the science of classifying our organisms, uh, usually based on, um, based on shared characteristics. A lot of times we talk about physical characteristics when we're classifying organisms here. Okay, and um, one of the reasons why scientists use it and need it is because common names can be confusing. Like the example that we have here, both of these are um, called a robin. Okay? And this one is a robin called a robin in Europe. This one is called a robin in the United States. Just by looking at it, you can probably see that they are two totally different birds. Okay? Uh, the one from Europe is smaller. The head is a different color. The beak is different. Okay? The legs are skinnier. Okay? So its coloring is different than the American one that is red all the way through, and it's Wings are darker and larger in the head coloring. <coughs> so these are very different organisms. But if you had a scientist from America that's talking about a robin and a scientist from Europe that's talking about a robin, they could end up talking about two different organisms. So we classify them and we give them these scientific names to help knock down on confusion. Okay, um, most of you probably know what a mountain lion is, but a lot of you have no idea what a catamount is. Well, they're the same thing. Again, it's the different regions, call them different things. So these are our different levels of classification. So we have the largest being up here with domain. Okay. There are three domains. They are called the Eukarya domain, the Eubacteria domain, and the RK domain. So these are the biggest, broadest categories that we have. Okay? The organisms in there still have a lot of variety in them. For instance, the eukarya domain, okay, all it has to have is the organisms have to have eukaryotic cells. Okay? So that then covers plants, animals, fungus, protists. As long as there is a eukaryotic cell, it's part of that eukarya domain. Okay, so these are big, broad, not very specific categories. And then as we work our way down, we get more and more specific, and the organisms within them start to share more and more characteristics. Okay, um, so we go down through kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then finally down to species, which is unique to one single organism. So you can see here, um, you've got the classification of an Asian elephant here. So it's in the animal kingdom. Okay? It would be in the eukarya domain because it is made of eukaryotic cells. It's in the animal kingdom, phylum chordata, class mammals, okay? order proboscidea, uh, family elephantidae, and then you get its genus and species, which is how you get its actual name, Elephas maximus. Okay? So that would be the scientific name that, they would that would be used when describing an Asian elephant in the scientific community, that you have the Elephas maximus. And for instance, an African elephant would have a different scientific name. So like I said, as we work our way down, we become more and more specific. So we narrow down the categories here. So here I've got a couple of examples of kingdoms. Like this would be examples from the animal kingdom. Wide variety of organisms with legs, organisms that live on land. Um, all those are invertebrates, but we have vertebrates, you know, just a very wide variety. Here you've got um, a bunch of examples from the plant kingdom. Okay, just general basic characteristics that they share in common. Uh, so when we go down to our next level, okay, here's our phylum. Okay, and this is a phylum chordata. Okay, phylum chordata is um, basically the fact that they have a vertebrae. Okay, they have a notochord. And so these organisms okay, are a little bit more narrowed down than just the animal kingdom in general. So here we're narrowing it down even further. Okay, this would be the class of reptiles. So they have even more things in common than the phylum did. Okay, the class has more characteristics in common. Okay, and then we have our order here. Okay, so from this, or you can classify these organisms into, these are in two different orders. Okay, they have different wings, they have different mouth parts. Okay, it doesn't matter, they're in the same class, insecta, but then we narrow it down again and separate them out some more into order. Down here, we've separated these out into family, okay, basically the feline family. So they, at this point, you're narrowing it down. So these organisms at this point have more similarities than they have differences by the time they come into the same family. Okay, like I said, they have more similarities than they will have differences. 
And by the time I narrow it down to a genus and a species, these organisms are uh, very, very closely related. In the genus, right, they are very few species in the within the genus. They have very, very few differences. Okay, and the species is specific to one particular organism. Okay, for example, there is a genus, and we write their scientific names. We write their scientific names by using the genus comes first, and it's capitalized, okay, and then the species comes second, and it is not capitalized. It is lowercase. So in this instance here with the gray wolf, Canis lupus, okay, the Canis is the genus, okay, and the species name here is lupus. And so there'll be a few other species that start with Canis, okay, because that is still a category that has more than one organism in it. And so the more of these categories that an organism shares, the more closely related they are to one another. Okay, Y'all do need to uh, make sure you know the order of these. Okay, uh, we use the mnemonic to help you remember the orders of, of these. Okay, so I've got did King Philip come over from Germany, I'm going to run out of room, safely. Okay, so did King Philip come over from Germany safely? Okay, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay, did King Philip come over from Germany safely? Okay, so let's look at this chart for just a second and see if you can answer some questions. Like, for instance, what if I asked you, okay, what kind of um, animal is Musca domestica? So hopefully using this chart, you can see that that is a commonly called a fly. Okay. What if I asked you um, which two are the most closely related? So of those three, cat, wolf, and fly, which two are the most closely related? Okay, most of you probably say cat and wolf just because of, um, you know, thinking of their regular characteristics. But what you really want to do is you want to look at this and see how many of these categories do they have in common. Okay, at first I've got all three. Okay, now I split. Fly goes off on its own and phylum. Cat and wolf stay together all the way down through order. They don't separate until they get to different families. Okay, so those two are the most closely related to one another because they share the most character. Um, they're going to share more characteristics. Um, sometimes on a test, they'll ask you about um, which two are most closely related to one, uh, one another, and they'll just give you names, scientific names. And so if the genus is the same, okay, that means those two share their kingdom, their phylum, their class, order, family, and their genus. Okay. And so they would be the most closely related to one another. So hopefully a lot of you guys remember what this is. Okay, This is a very shortened, abbreviated version of a dichotomous key. Okay. Remember, a dichotomous key is going to be used to classify or categorize unknown objects. Okay. So we're going to use this when we've got an unknown organism, okay. and we always start at the beginning of it. So if I have these two leaves down here, okay, and I'm going to classify this first one here, Okay, so I start at number one, I start up here with this pair, and I choose which one it is. No teeth, waves, or lobes. Okay, so that tells me I go to number two. So now I go to this pair of clues. Has a bristle at its tip, has uh, no bristle at its tip. Well, this one has a little bristle at its tip. So this one is a shingle oak. Okay, now I want to classify this leaf. I start again up here at number one has a uh, leaf edge with no teeth, waves, or lobes, has teeth, waves, or lobes. Well, this one has waves, so I would go to number three. And number three isn't on here. I'm not going to you know, put all of that up there. But that's what most people forget about the dichotomous key, is that we always have to start at the very beginning. Okay, so we're going to start our uh, discussion of kingdoms in just a minute, but we need to make sure that you know some of the basic terms that we're going to be talking about when we are you know, organizing these kingdoms and talking about the characteristics of the ver various kingdoms. So let's start with vertebrate versus invertebrate. Hopefully you guys remember what those are. Remember that's a backbone, essentially, versus a no backbone. And so all the examples we have up on the picture here, all of these would be vertebrates. These down here would actually be invertebrates. They would not have a backbone. 
Okay, we also have what's called segmentation. Okay, so with segmentation, we've got the body is divided, but it's divided into repetitive segments. Okay, it's gonna be the same thing over and over and over again. So um, worms have the high segmentation. Um, this uh, organism here, this uh, centipede here, has a high segmentation, and the body is again divided into repetitive segments. Okay, so we also have um, some of our kingdoms will be classified as uh, unicellular organisms or multicellular organisms. Okay, our unicellular organisms, you can find those in the bacterial kingdoms, both of them, as well as in the protist and one of fungus. Okay, yeast is an example of the only fungus that is unicellular. Okay, um, so that's where you'll see those. Multicellular organisms. Okay, so the organism is made of more than one cell. Plants, animals, most of your fungus. Okay, and remember those cells in the kingdom can either be prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Remember your prokaryotic cell is um, no membrane bound organelles, no mitochondria, no nucleus, no endoplasmic reticulum. Where your eukaryote will have all that stuff. It will have membrane bound organelles. Okay, so nutrition for these organisms, um, we also have two basic choices here. We have an autotroph versus a heterotroph. Hopefully you guys remember that an autotroph makes its own food. A heterotroph needs food from a different source. So let's look at our autotrophs first, okay, because there are two kinds of autotrophs that we can have. We can have what's called a chemosyn uh, chemosynthetic autotroph. Okay, so a chemosynthetic autotroph is going to take non-living nutrients, things like sulfur, iron, okay, so it's going to take these non-living nu nutrients and it's going to convert them into living tissue. So basically, the, basically they're going to make their own food using these metals, these minerals, okay, where your other option of an autotroph is a photosynthetic autotroph. Okay, and hopefully you guys remember your photosynthetic autotroph. Okay, so this one is going to use the sun's energy to make its own food. So it'll convert the energy from the sun <coughs> into its organic compounds. Okay, the other way that an organism can obtain food is as a heterotroph. Okay, and so as a heterotroph, We have two basic kinds of those. Okay, we have what's called an absorption heterotroph as well as an ingestion heterotroph. Okay, so an absorption heterotroph. An absorption heterotroph is going to digest the food outside of its body. So it'll secrete digestive enzymes. Okay, it'll break down the food outside of its body and then absorb the nutrients. These would be things like decomposers. You know how when food is rotting and getting yucky, okay, it will get softer. And that's because the fungus that's on it, or if there's, um, you know, the fungus or the mold that's on it, is, it, they act as an absorption heterotroph. So it's breaking down that food so it can absorb the nutrients. And you can also have what's called an ingestion heterotroph. And an ingestion heterotroph is actually going to ingest the food. Right, so um, they're going to actually eat. Okay, they take the food in and um, digest inside the body. So we, for example, would be in an ingestion heterotroph. The last things we have are mobile versus immobile, which sometimes you will see as motile versus usually non-motile. Okay, and that's the same thing. You know, they either move or they don't. So if they're mobile or motile, they're able to move. If they're uh, immobile or non-motile, they don't move. Okay? And then we have symmetry. We have two basic kinds of symmetry. We have what's called bilateral symmetry, where the right and left mirror one another. And okay? so the right half of this dragonfly is the same as the left half of the dragonfly. And then we have what's called radial symmetry. And so with radial symmetry, we've got a distribution of duplicate body parts. Okay, so the same, 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 same. They all radiate out, okay, and so we've got this distribution of body parts that are the same. Okay, so we're going to flip over to your chart. 
So you should be taking some notes on your chart now, and we're going to talk about the characteristics of the different kingdoms. And so the first uh, kingdom that we're going to talk about is the eubacteria. Okay? Eubacteria is actually part of the eubacteria domain. It's the only kingdom in that domain. Okay, and so eubacteria are obviously made out of bacterial cells. The, the organisms in this kingdom are bacterial. So based on what we hopefully remember about bacteria, you can hopefully tell me that the kind of cell this is going to be is this is going to be a prokaryote. Remember, it's not going to have any membrane-bound organelles. Okay, this is going to be a prokaryotic cell. Okay, it's also going to be a unicellular organism. There are no multicellular bacteria out there. This is a unicellular organism. So a prokaryotic unicellular organism that does have a cell wall. Okay, it does have a cell wall, and that cell wall is made up of peptidoglycans, which is going to be sugars and proteins. Okay, so it has a cell wall that is made of peptidoglycans. Glycans. Um, these organisms can get their nutrition either way. Okay? So they can be an autotroph or a heterotroph. And you've got it's such a big, broad kingdom that you'll have some heterotrophs and some autotrophs. Okay? <coughs> As for what kind, Autotroph-wise, you can have both. So you can have uh, chemosynthetic autotrophs. Some of these bacteria are chemosynthetic. Some of them are photosynthetic. When it comes to heterotrophs, okay, if they are a heterotroph, then they are an absorption heterotroph. These would be our decomposers that are a wonderful thing for us. Okay, they break down dead things, and so they do that as absorption heterotrophs. Okay, so these eubacteria also um, reproduce usually asexually, that binary fission. Okay, they have enough mutations that occur, and they do have some adaptations to help exchange material through other bacteria, but they reproduce as a whole asexually. Okay, some are mobile, some are not. Okay, so some in this kingdom are able to move around, some of them are not. If they're able to move around in this kingdom, then they probably have a flagellum attached to them, which helps them to be able to propel themselves forward. Okay, so some are motile, some are not. They also, uh, these are the organisms that live in very, very common environments. When we're talking by common, I mean um, on your skin. Okay, on your doorknob, in your sheets. Okay, these organisms uh, live on the land, water, air, in and on organisms. These are the ones that make us sick. So these kind of bacteria have symbiotic relationships with humans. And okay, they have good and they have bad relationships with humans. For, so our bad sense is the fact that they can be pathogenic. Okay, so these um, bacteria can be pathogenic. Okay, um, good is that they, um, they can help with us, us with digestion. Okay, they act as decomposers. They can be used in environmental cleanup. Okay, so these are the bacteria that we interact with on an everyday, um, in an everyday situation. These are the ones that are on your skin, they're on your desk, they're in your yogurt, they're everywhere. Um, some examples of these would be uh, things like streptococcus. This picture. I was trying to move that picture. I'm going to scoot that over there to be able to write more. Okay. So some examples then would be streptococcus. Uh, let's see. What else would be some examples? Um, TB, tuberculosis, okay. um, E. coli. There's good and there's bad E. coli. There's the E. coli that you hear about 
um, on the news that makes everybody sick from food poisoning, and there's the E. coli that live in your intestines constantly. Okay, um, gonorrhea is a bacterial disease. Okay, so wide variety of bacterial or U bacteria out there. The last kingdom we're going to look at today is the RK bacteria. Um, these came out of the RK domain. And again, they're a kind of bacteria. So they're going to have to be a prokaryote. Right? No membrane-bound organelles. No endoplasmic reticulum. No um, Golgi body. So they're prokaryotic. They're bacteria. So again, they're unicellular. They're not very organized. and They're not organized into tissues or organs. Okay? They do have a cell wall. And most of your RK bacteria their cell wall is going to be made out of lipids. They said not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay. These can, again, be an autotroph or a heterotroph. They are non-motile, so these bacteria do not move around, which means they probably do not have a flagellum to help push them and move them around. The last thing about the RK bacteria, the thing that really sets them apart from the U bacteria, because so far they're both prokaryotic, they're both unicellular, they both have a cell wall. Granted, the cell wall is different. U bacteria made of peptidoglycan, RK bacteria mostly lipids. They both, the category can have both autotrophs and heterotrophs. And the RK bacteria, they're all non-modal, where in the U, U bacteria, some of them are able to move around. But the thing that really is going to set these apart is where they live. Okay? These bacteria live in what are called extreme environments. They do not live where we do. RK bacteria is not going to be on you. Um, some examples of these would be things like methanogens that live where methane gas is very high. Okay? Um, extreme ones uh, like thermophiles. Thermophiles live where it's really, really hot or very, very cold. Um, we've got some ice here that the bacteria could live on. Doubt the in the ocean vents, okay, where it's hot and the pressure is very intense. Um, in a hot spraying geyser here, okay, uh, this is a very salty environment, and those are called halophiles. Okay, so halophiles can, can survive that um, extreme salt concentration. So these live in, like I said, what are considered extreme environments. Humans don't live there. Humans don't live there. Um, RK bacteria could live there. U bacteria don't. So they live in, um, they live in two very, very different places. Okay, so we'll pick up with the eukarya domain next time, and we'll do plants, animals, protists, and fungus.